Okay, sorry for that. Little internet problems. I was about this close to running slides.com off my phone, but he saved me with the ethernet cable. A um, couple quick announcements. So uh, one thing I want to make sure you know is that uh, the piece set this week is a little bit longer than last week, but it's awesome. It's really good. And, it's, it's, you know, it has you building full robots, you know, doing things, and a lot of people build off this problem set for their project. So, you know, we decided to not make it shorter and, and keep it. I think it's pretty good. Um, I have a random question, just quick show of hands. How many people have uh, thought about the Roman Empire this week? <laughs> okay, so that was, I know what that was. Okay, I know, I know who watches TikTok, yeah. That's good. My, my daughter made me ask that, and I did. She's going to be happy that I, I went through with it. It's, if you didn't get it, you're better off. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I want to continue on our, uh, our conversation about kinematics. And in particular, you remember our sort of our plan here was to do basic pick and place. Just very simple. We've got a robot. We've got a red brick. We want to move the, the red brick from one bin to the second bin, yeah? And our plan for that was to go through some of the mechanics of, of geometry, of, of kinematics, of spatial algebra, right? I tried to lift it a little bit above sine and cosine and talk about the algebra uh, involved in spatial geometries. And then <clears throat> to actually write the code, the first step we, we do is we just forget about the robot entirely and just imagine in the land of transforms, what's the ideal place for my gripper to be? You know, we, we made some keyframes for picking up, for clearing, for setting down, and then we tried to compose that into a trajectory, and we were a little careful to try to interpolate that trajectory nicely, even in the rotations, right? So we had to use a proper uh, slurp interpolation for that. Okay, but then the problem, of course, is that that's in the gripper trajectory, and ultimately what we need to do is send uh, position commands to the robot. So we started talking about kinematics, which is the mapping from joint angles on the robot to, for instance, gripper end effector position, okay? And we did that by just more kinematics, more spatial transforms. We have a frame for every link. The, the <clears throat> transforms between those frames are given as a function of the local joint angle, and you can just compose those transforms to go all the way up to the end effector. The last step, which is the goal for today, is to, to actually take that all the way through to the robot commands. And we're going to do that with differential inverse kinematics. Okay, so uh, let me say it even a slightly different way. You'll understand why, I think, in some detail by the end of the class here. But we have, from our previous work, x is the pose, right? of the gripper in the world frame, okay? And we have a trajectory for it. So we have it defined from, you know, zero to 30 seconds or something like that. And we need Q as a function of time. And really what we need is the desired Q as a function of time because that's what our abstraction on the robot takes in, you know, this Iwa position command. There's software running on the robot that's waiting for that message to arrive, which tells me what's the desired position. In my, and I've mocked that with the hardware station. So inside here is the plant, the geometry engine, but also the low-level controller simulation, which is waiting for the same EWA position. And even though it's spelled out here, we're just thinking of that as Q desired. That's the commanded position of the arm. Okay, so we need to somehow go from the end effector pose to the joint angles in the arm. And last time we talked about the relationship between those two. We talked about forward kinematics. Which was the mapping to the gripper as a function. We called it, we annotated the function with the frame it was working on. Called it the kinematics function here, which took the, 
the joint angles of the arm and did that series of calculations to get to the end. So to go the other way, what we need somehow is the inverse kinematics, right? We need to somehow go from, um, from x through something like f inverse to get back to q. Inverse kinematics is hard. In general, it's very hard, okay? Often there are many solutions. Sometimes there's no solutions. Um, the equations in here, even though they're a simple series of transforms, they have a lot of nonlinear equations going on inside here. It's a pretty nonlinear, non-trivial function of Q. Okay, so what we're going to do today, though, is take, is, is, is solve that problem, but in a slightly roundabout way. We're going to do it on the differential kinematics. Okay, so this is a complicated mapping, and we'll solve it nicely with stronger optimization tools when we have them a little later in the class, okay? But for today, we don't need to solve the harder problem. We can actually make it easy again by going into the differential kinematics, okay? Okay, so I'm going to write it at the high level and we'll go through it in detail, right? But roughly Vg is our spatial velocities. which is the, like a, the derivative of the poses, okay? This is related, as it says on the board there, through a simple relationship with, it depends, well, it's a, it's a non-trivial relationship to the joint positions, but it's a simple linear relationship to the joint velocities. Okay, so if I know instantaneously where the robot is, that's what Q is, then I can just, then this just becomes a matrix, okay? And the relationship between VG and V is simple. So I can instantaneously, if I know where the robot is, I can command uh, a change in joint angles that would affect, cause the right change in joint velocity. And it's not surprising that even though the map, the full kinematic map is hard, the differential kinematic map is easy. Right? Small changes here relate to small changes here, and you just have to know, you know the derivatives, basically, to make that work. Okay. Now this is something we're going to work with easily, and it's not uh, perfect. It has limitations, but the limitations are clear uh, because they come from linear algebra. Yeah. We're going to do it through as a dynamical system, yeah. We're going to do it by uh, incrementally, I would say. You, and we will, of course, do it numerically, but, uh, but incrementally maybe is the better view. So our plan here is to go from xg as a trajectory to vg as a trajectory. We're going to send this into a system that we'll call diff ik. You'll hear that a lot, the differential inverse kinematics. Okay, And this is going to give us v which is the joint velocities, and then we're going to actually integrate that back. Okay, integrator. And get Q. So it seems a little roundabout, but it's going to be the way that I think sheds the most insight, and it's, people do this in practice. It's, it, for many reasons, it's a very nice formulation. Okay, so it's a uh, workhorse in, in robotics. And again, the, the immediate reason, just to say it, you know, so this is a big nonlinear function, hard to analyze, hard to invert in closed form. There's some cases where you can, but oftentimes you cannot. This is a, once Q is known, this is a linear map. We know everything about it in linear algebra. Okay. So to do this well and to understand all the details, we're gonna, um, because all the details come up because of the complexity of 3D rotations. I promised you last time that I'd say a few more words about 3D rotations and the different representations. Okay. You guys were asking some good questions about it. 
Let's just talk a little bit more about 3D rotations. <clears throat> so there's a lot of ways to represent 3D rotations. Um, one of them is rotation matrices. In the 3D case, that would be a three by three matrix. Okay, nine, nine total numbers. Uh, it's a very efficient representation because GPUs made it great, right? Uh, you can transform, you can push things through uh, rotation matrices very fast, okay? Uh, <clears throat> but it's, it's over-parameterized in some sense, right? So uh, we don't need nine numbers to describe a 3D rotation. This is extra. And in fact, not all nine numbers will work. There are constraints on nine, the nine numbers that make a, a valid rotation matrix, right? In particular, if I call the rotation matrix R, then, well, R needs to be orthonormal. The rotation matrix needs to be orthonormal. The simplest way to write that would be to say if I have a, a matrix R, then R, R transpose needs to be the identity. This is all three by three. And there's even one other constraint that comes in. Bless you. If you want a regular rotation, you want the determinant of R to be one. You don't have to know that, but what's important is that <clears throat> if you just give me nine random numbers, or you try to write a program that's you know combing over, searching over nine numbers, not all nine numbers are sufficient. They have to also satisfy some extra constraints to be valid rotation matrix. So that's a burden to carry that around, right? And if you're doing, let's say, even numerical integration of rotation matrices, if you're not projecting back, you know, if you, you, small numerical errors can leave you can leave this these constraints behind. So you have to do projected methods and the like. Okay, let's contrast that with um, Euler angles. And there's many, you can, you, can, uh, you can write any permutation of rolls and pitches and yaws if you want, but we're, we always do the extrinsic roll pitch yaw when I talk about it. It's one of the choices. It is actually three numbers. Roll, which is rotation around x. Pitch, which is rotation around y. Z, which is yaw, which is rotation around z. Okay. This is great. It's three numbers. No constraints. Right, so that seems smaller. Okay, it's only better, right? Um, no constraints, that's better. But there's a gotcha, right? There's, there's, a, there's places where that rotation becomes, that, that, rota um, that set of three numbers becomes degenerate. And the way that people, um, the best way to see this, by the way, I've written this up with links to like more references and stuff in the notes. But the classic example is gimbal lock, okay? I got about halfway through making a mustard model, bottle in MeshCat, do, the, do all this, and I was like, screw it. They got, there's so many good visualizations online, and my, mine wasn't, like, the mustard bottle was in the wrong frame, and nobody knows what the x-axis of the mustard bottle is. So I just put, picked up this website real quick, okay? Um, this is pretty good. Okay, so, so this is a, a spaceship, <laughs> I guess. So um, this is roll, okay? This is pitch. Put it back to zero so pitch is clean. So pitch is nose up, nose down, for instance, okay? And yaw is rotation around z, so the nominal thing. But because these, these transformations are chained, then things get more complicated when you do them in series. In particular, the weird case is when I pitch to 90, okay? Then well, you can kind of you can see it with the visualization already, but rolling does this. Yawing also does that. So because in that configuration, rolling and yawing do the same thing. They, they cannot be distinguished, but that also means there's some direction where you cannot move instantaneously, right? There's a singularity in the trans, translation between those numbers and a full rotation matrix, from a, a full rotation back to those numbers, okay? 
So you're kind of stuck. The coordinate system becomes degenerate in that case. Two of the numbers are representing the same rotation, and therefore there's no number representing one of the important rotations. Okay, and there's you know theorems saying that you cannot perfectly represent in a, in a singularity-free way the three D rotations with just three numbers. You need four numbers to do it. Okay, <clears throat> another one that is um, super useful but also Degenerate in this particular way, in these kind of ways, is axis angle. It's also three numbers. No constraints, but degenerate in some setting. And this is, um, it's an x, y, z, so we normally would write, um, I'll just do x, y, z, that's fine. It's a three-dimensional uh, three quantity where the direction of x, y, z is the instantaneous uh, direction of rotation. So that's the axis I'm rotating around. And the magnitude of the vector is the, is the magnitude of the rotation. So you can imagine if I want to just rotate from, from here to here, I can pick the, any, for any rotations, you can pick up some single axis and rotate a scalar quantity around that axis to represent those rotations. Okay, yeah. Zero vectors is a good example of it, yeah. We're actually, we're gonna ask you that one on the problem set. Yes? Uh, they're, they're all very closely related. The, the screw theory is more closely related to the angular velocity, which is extremely closely related to this, yep. Okay, very tempting, three numbers. So the, the direction is axis of rotation and magnitude is the angle. And the last one that we use all the time here is unit quaternions. There's a quaternion algebra that I will not lecture about. You don't need to, I mean, you can just call methods and, and uh, in the software and it'll just do the right thing. You don't have to know the quaternion algebra for this class. Okay, but this is four numbers plus one constraint, which is that the four numbers are unit length in total. So. We typically call them Q, X, Y, Z. I'm sorry, W, X, Y, Z. And then I'll, I'll sometimes write Q in front of them. So remember, it's a quaternion. Okay. I'll write that bigger and with less mistakes. Hold on a second. I'll just, for now, just say W, X, Y, Z. Okay. And the one constraint is that it, the vector be unit length. So w squared plus x squared plus y squared plus z squared has to equal one. That is the minimal representation that we have, four numbers, one constraint, okay, that is singularity free. It still has some quirks, uh, like you can, you can just flip your unit quaternion inside and you get the same rotation. So that's not too bad, okay? <clears throat> so I'll tell you the most common things we're gonna see when we want a vector, notation, a vector representation of our rotations, we're gonna cho choose these four numbers almost always. That's the most compact, okay? But when we're just thinking about kinematics and multiplying transforms, boom, 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 as soon as we get into that, Kind of space we're going to go with the, the three by three and not worry about efficiency as much we're going to just be able to just multi multiply these quickly the euler angle and the axis angle are super useful to know about um, we used them already when we were doing the transform if you look in the, the code we used both axis angle and euler angle because it was convenient to interpolate between these two with axis angle and it was convenient to write some of the other things in roll pitch yaw and like the robot description formats tend to just ask for things and roll pitch y'all. So it's good to know about them, 
But the most important thing to know about them is that you can flip back and forth between them. Okay, They're mostly equivalent until you're in some singular sort of configuration. OK, so with that, oh yeah, please. Yeah. So, um, so you can uniquely define a rotation. Uh, so, so every let me say this, every rotation has a rotation matrix. That's okay. Yeah. Um, this one is the one that's degenerate in some places. Yeah. And these, this is degenerate. So both of all of these, I think, are are complete. Those two are complete in some sense. Like every rotation, you can write as a rotation matrix or as a unit quaternion. That is also true of Euler angles, but but it's just that the um, the maps between them can get singular. Yep. Yep. So um, every. Yes, every rotation can has it. Well, you have you can have a unique choice of the rotation matrix. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here. Yes. There's always patterns where things are equivalent. But in general, no. I, as I say, in general, no. So the order of the of the rotations matters, and even there's people will talk about extrinsic roll pitch yaw versus intrinsic roll pitch yaw, which matters if you apply roll first or yaw first. They're all different representations. They're all equivalent, but they you have to be careful converting back and forth between them. Yeah. Ah, it's it's actually it's I didn't explain them and in and in some sense they're they're like complex numbers they are actually the the four dimensional generalization of complex numbers so like asking me to you know explain complex numbers quickly is kind of you know hard you know it, there it's it's sort of magical algebraic properties that make them useful so it turns out that with those four numbers uh, you can you can define an entire algebra that captures all the rotations. Intuitively, you can think of this almost like axis angle, where this is a direct direction and this is a magnitude, except that the whole thing is scaled very cleverly so that, um, so that it avoids those singularities. Yeah? I would say when you're trying to initialize quaternions, set w to 1 and then set those to be your, uh, your, your direction of interest, and you'll be pretty good. Or use roll pitch yaw and then convert to quaternion. That's way better. This one's less intuitive, I'd say. Yes. Yes, real. Yeah. The interpretation as a complex numbers, which actually my favorite notes about that are, are linked in the in the notes if you if you if you like it. Um, yeah, this would be you would you add introduce, introduce complex numbers in order to to understand it in that through that lens. Yeah. Because W is implied. I'd be happy to write it everywhere, but if I'd leave it off, then um, my shorthand is that uh, if I didn't write a superscript, then the relative frame is the world. That's great. Good, good to catch me on that. And uh, good. Yes? That's true. Yeah. Um, so some software uses X, Y, Z, W. I mean, I learned the alphabet a long time ago, and I don't like that. Uh, I, I think W, X, Y, Z is always better. I'm sorry if you use it. Yeah, but uh, yeah, no, no. Even inside, like we use Eigen as a library in C++, and they put that in the last one. But we do everything we can to hide that from you. And, and, uh, and so it's always W, X, Y, Z for us. It just makes more sense, right? Why do they get the name? 
I mean, I, it, it's not, so that is mostly true. I think that's the right way to, to understand it. Um, but really, there are also elements from a four-dimensional space that live on the, the you know, live on this uh, sphere in, in four numbers. So, uh, yeah, where did W come from? I don't know. I don't know. That, I, bet, I bet that reference I linked would, would give you the history of it. Yeah. This is where we care about being efficient, especially if we want to put it in a vector. In fact, this is a good, this is a great lead-in. So, for instance, if I'm listing the, um, you know, when I list the joint angles of my robot in my Q vector, let's, I think I even have a slide for this. Yeah. Okay. So, if I have the Q vector for Iwa, let me just before I even use that slide, uh, if the robot is is Iwa, then the Q vector is uh, just the list of joint angles, right? So it's going to be seven numbers. It's a seven by one vector. So if you have a Q vector for um, a system that is just a single brick floating in space, then the, the positions that define that are just the 3D rotation. So if you, if you ask for what is Q, and you ask for, you know, if you ask for what is Q for that, Q for the brick, you'll also find out that it gets a seven by one vector. But that seven by one is going to be X, Y, Z, Q, W, Q, X, Q, Y, Q, Z. Okay, positions and orientations in quaternion form is the way we choose to represent the generalized positions of our robot. So when we, want, when we choose a vector notation, this is our favorite vector notation. As opposed to like sticking nine numbers and unrolling them, or picking one that could potentially be de degenerate. Now if you, if you take and compute the, the transform, if you, if you ask for the kinematics call, right? So Val body pose in world is sort of the, how do you evaluate the, the kinematics given the context? It's going to give you this back in three by three matrix. Well, it's actually a, the, the, four by, the three by four matrix, which is the rigid transform. The three by three matrix plus the vectors. So in those two places, right next to each other in the code, we choose quaternions for this and rotation matrices for that. Yeah. Quaternions have, a, have their, their algebra that, that, yes, they compose nicely. You have to learn that. It's, a, it's a kind of a, its own algebra, but, but it, it does have the nice rules of composition. Okay. So when, if in this particular case, if you're calling the kinematics function, which is the val body pose in world, for a thing that just is a brick, then that function is actually just implementing the change of coordinates, uh, the, the change of rotations from a vector Q into the trans the three by three matrix. That's the only work it's doing. Right? It doesn't have to do composition of frames, it's just one frame. But it still has to convert representation. Yeah? Okay, so the differential kinematics then gets so you see why that so you see why this is starting to get subtle is that this is potentially like a three by three matrix or a three by four matrix, for instance, and this is potentially a seven seven by one vector. And so, <clears throat> if we're thinking about the kinematics like that, and we start thinking about the gradients of that, then we have to be careful about the different representations. Okay, so the differential kinematics are roughly just taking the gradient, the partial derivative of of you know of that kinematics function. That's the object we want to think about. But all the details of how you represent that, so by the way, we almost always call it the Jacobian, kinematic Jacobian. Well, you know, the Jacobian, any, any partial derivative in any discipline could be called a Jacobian. But I guess in robotics, we just always call it, we just, when we say Jacobian with no other context, it's almost always the kinematic Jacobian. Okay? <clears throat> but all the details about this are about you know how did you represent Q and how did you represent pose, okay? And there's details there that, that matter. 
So in order to understand those details, we have one more thing to do, which is we have to understand what, what are convenient ways to write the derivatives of rotation. Okay, so you could imagine that I could write the, the time derivative of a rotation matrix. That's a perfectly well-defined object. I could have the nine values all changing with time. Right? I could have the roll pitch yaw, roll dot, pitch dot, yaw dot, all changing with time. But those are all totally valid. But in the case of derivatives of rotations, there is a canonical, canonical choice. You can use three numbers and without, have any, without any limitations. There's like a uniquely good choice and we always use it, okay? And it's most similar to the axis angle. And that's the spatial velocity, okay? It's approximately the time derivative of, it's, it is the time derivative of the notion of rotation, but it's, but when I, but as soon, it's not the time derivative of the three by four matrix, okay? It's, it's defined to be a six by one vector. V of the gripper. Okay, this is this angular velocity and the translational velocity is a six by one vector. Okay, with the angular velocity and the translational velocity. The angular velocity is always three numbers and you can represent it without any of the quirks. Okay, and the people who think about like geometry a lot or differential geometry a lot, that's natural and obvious, but it's slightly, slightly non-trivial. But basically, um, there's a couple different ways to say it. Actually, Tommy and I were arguing earlier today about what's the best way to say it, but because um, Tommy loves differential geometry. If you haven't gone to his office hours and asked him about differential geometry, you should. It's, uh, uh, so um, maybe the simplest thing, thing to say is that you could think about um, angles actually wrap around Right? So they, they have a periodicity involved, right? So if I rotate by two pi more, then I get back to the same angle. And so there's some quirks that come with that, and that's like the pitch rolling in and on itself and everything like that. Angular velocities can be unbounded, right? More velocity means I'm going more that way. There's no wraparound effects or anything like that. So that's maybe one of the simplest ways to see why the geometry of that object is different. And it turns out that these three numbers which have the interpretation, the angular velocity has the interpretation where the, the three numbers, the direction is again the instantaneous axis of rotation and the magnitude is the rate of rotation around that axis. That's why it's most similar to the axis angle. Yeah. That's what Drake follows. Most, I, I don't know if it's everybody, I think people choose, but uh, we've tried to be, everywhere you see it in, in this class, we've tried to be very consistent, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here three numbers are sufficient and efficient everywhere, so you'll always see us using the angular velocity specifically. Okay, now, <clears throat> um, angular velocities, yeah, please. Correct. Uh, okay. Well, so um, if you think about some of the constrained representations, let's say the unicoternian has to live on the surface of a sphere, okay? So the, the geometry behind that, you think about this as the tangent surface of the sphere, is where the velocities live on. And that is a well-defined object that is you know, unbounded and, and perfectly sort of well-defined. So it's not, I didn't pull a rabbit out of a hat. It's, it's, it's actually sort of the, the tangent bundle of, of these sort of geometric quantities. Very good, yeah. Yes, so you're, so you're absolutely right. So 
the point here is it's a little weird. So in fact, if I take Q Iwa and I have seven numbers, and then I say what's the um, the angular velocity, you know, the the generalized velocity v. By the way, so I said be, watch my notation, right? So capital V with this script is spatial velocity. Lowercase v in the same font is translational velocity. The times v, times Roman v, is the generalized velocity. There's three of them flying around. It's almost always clear from the context, okay? But there are three v's flying around. Yeah. This is the one that corresponds to like the, the general, when I say generalized velocity or generalized, that's like the joint angles. And if you have to pack a free body into the joint angles, then you use quaternions. And for velocities, you get a six by one list of numbers. And so you're absolutely right. It's a little weird that Q dot would be seven numbers, but I have V is six numbers. And so you have to watch that and, and treat that carefully. Yeah. It's, it, it, so in, for the Iwa, it's, uh, it's just, it'd be just seven and seven, but it, I'm sorry, I wrote this completely wrong. V, uh, v Iwa is seven by one. It's V brick that's six by one. That was the whole point of writing that on the board, just so I get that right. Six by one, okay? Yeah, so this one, since these are all rotations, simple pin joints, all of their velocities are still a scalar, and I get seven numbers. But since this one's using a quaternion representation, I only need six numbers to represent its time derivative. Yeah? Correct, exactly, exactly right. So, you, so just to say it out loud, uh, since I'm um, on the mic here, so yeah, so in the, in the six numbers, there are six numbers, no constraints, no degeneracies. It's three numbers, which is WX, WY, WZ. Whoops, that's a Z. Um, and, and that's the direction of instantaneous uh, rotation. And the magnitude of it is the, the magnitude of the vector is the, the rate of rotation around that vector. It's actually it's interesting that any rotate any uh, derivative of rotation can be represented that way, but you can always pick an instantaneous direction of rotation and a magnitude. And even more so, which is actually what I was putting up here, it has like nicely magical properties. So it has the same sort of algebra. Addition in angular velocity, you know, has the same, uh, it, it works when the, the frames match. Just a second, okay. Which is totally weird to think about, I've got a direction, I've got a rot instantaneous you know, rotation around this, I've got another direction, I can just add them. So that's, uh, it's non-trivial, but it works. Okay, the additive inverse works, okay. And then the, you know, so we have the same al the same sort of algebra. They're slightly more complicated. Uh, there's a, some cross product terms that come in, but but it works. Yes. Good. So so the question is then. So when I call, um, you guys are awesome. You're leading all of my uh, slides here by a little bit here. So this is your question from a minute ago, right? Which is that actually there is a simple matrix that transitions between the two. So the fact that Q and V are not the same, you, but there's a simple transformation that you can use uh, that goes back and forth between them. You can call map Q dot to velocity or vice versa. And it's done you know, efficiently and everything. And then for your question, okay, so um, if I wanna get a Jacobian in software, then the decisions I have to make are do I want the, the right-hand side of that to be multiplied by Q dot, or do I want to be multiplying it by V? And you can actually just pick Jacobian with respect to variable, and it's either Q dot or V. You can ask for either Jacobian, and it depends on the application which one you want. Okay? On the right-hand side, you can ask, do I want the, you know, Q, the Q dot kind of thing, or do I want the angular velocity? 
And almost always, we were going to give you this. That's why this one's called Calc Jacobian Spatial Velocity. That means the left-hand side is going to be written in terms of spatial velocities. Right? If you hear the term geometric Jacobian versus analytic Jacobian, the geometric Jacobian fits out spatial velocities. The analytic Jacobian is more literally d f forward kinematics dt. But we almost we rarely use that one. It's almost always spatial velocity because we always work in spatial velocities for for velocity. Okay, you can also notice just quickly with this up here, we we really do lean into the um, monogram notation for for everything. So it's like a little annoying the first time you, you do it, but it keeps everything clean and the, the equations are correct. Okay, that's good. I mean, I, I, I have a couple like check yourself, but I think you guys have checked yourself mostly. So uh, yeah, that makes sense. It's kind of, there's an outlier here, but, uh, but I think we all understand it. Yeah. This would be, in this case, it's just seven joint angles. Rotation, rotation, rotation. So they're pin joints. So it's the angle of each of those joints, which is relative angles. And this is the, the time derivative of those. This is translation plus quaternion, translation velocity plus, you know, this is the spatial velocity inside there. Okay, so, so we have a couple different ways to get um, J, and again, all of the details. The reason it's not just a simple time derivative is because of these rotation things. If, in 2D, you know, it's, everything's just clean. You just use theta. None of this, you know, th three numbers stuff, you know, four numbers stuff. Theta does everything you need, and then, you, you know, rotation matrices are two by two. They're, they're simple, you know. There's one choice, a canonical choice for Jacobians. It's just a little bit more work here. All right, so the rough idea for differential IK is to basically take J inverse. Okay, so nominally, I want, um, I want, say, my V desired, my, my generalized velocities, joint, let's even call it joint velocities. Of my gripper here, I'll take an inverse of that times my desired gripper spatial velocity. Okay, that's this is the idea behind diff i diff i k. Okay, but let's be a little careful. Every time you write an inverse, you got to think about: is that am I allowed to take an inverse of this? Is that matrix uh, invertible? Right. So. What's the answer in this case? So if I'm using, let's say for the Iwa, okay, and I've got the gripper frame. So how big is this? Six, seven, right? So that's not even a square matrix there, so it doesn't have an inverse. Okay? So that's a bit bad, and I shouldn't have ever written that on the board. But we can do a little bit better. By, if I just change that into a symbol of your choice, I normally use the, the number sign. That means, or the plus. Sometimes I use plus, actually. But um, what did I use? Plus. Let's go with plus. Depends on the day, but plus, OK? That's a pseudo inverse, OK? Yep, more Penrose pseudo inverse. So if you call pinv in MATLAB or in Python or something like this, that's going to give you the more Penrose pseudo inverse. Yeah. Uh, in this particular case, so it would still have the same problems. Um, that's a good question. So is there are there parts of the space where that would still work? There's still redundancy, so I don't think it could. I don't think it could, right? It's just more hidden in that case. The, 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 the matrix would have to be, 
right? Because, it, because in fact, a way to see it is that um, it's going to be the this j times this n. So it's going to be a low ma rank matrix times this n. So it's it won't be full full rank. It's a great question, though. Yes. Yeah. The simple answer, so the question is what about a six degree of freedom robot? The simple answer is yes, but the subtle, but it depends exactly on most of the robots that you can buy today, if they have six joints, then you can actually, that'll be full rank, okay? Um, you can still get them into singular configurations, okay? Uh, if you were to, you can't just take a random six links, you know, and like, uh, for instance, if I just gave you a bunch of prismatic joints and then ask you to control orientation at the end, that's not going to work, right? So, but uh, the standard revolute, revolute, six revolute, or the variations you see, yes. And that's actually, when you talk, hear people talking about analytic IK, they're typically exploiting the fact that six degrees of freedom can be controlled by six joints on a robot. Yeah. Okay, the pseudo inverse. Um, how many people have seen, used the pseudo inverse before, yeah? Do you know how awesome it is? Like, um, it's extremely good. It's like a very, I mean, you just call P inv and you don't think about it, okay? But it's like really smart. So, so what can happen in, when you're taking a matrix and uh, it's, it's not square and you're trying to invert it? I mean, basically, there's three possible situations. You could have no solutions. You could have, I mean, if, it was, if it's square, then you could have one solution, right? Or you can have infinite solutions. Okay, so the pseudo inverse sort of does exact the best possible thing it could do in every situation. If you have infinite solutions, it's going to give you a, one that satisfies it perfectly, but it, in the null space of that, it's going to pick the, the smallest solution, the minimum norm solution. Okay, if there's a unique solution, it will return the unique solution. It's just as good. It's a little more expensive than calling inverse, but it's, it's going to give you the same numbers as calling inverse up to numerical. Okay, if it's if there's no solutions, then it's going to give you a best effort solution. It's going to get as close as possible in a least square sense. Okay, so that's like a really really smart, and we'll understand, I guess, from an optimization perspective, how to generalize that um, soon. Okay, but let's appreciate it first. So, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So I understand how to do a pseudo inverse with all those magical properties for a linear transform. But if it's a nonlinear map, then I don't know I don't know how to do the same stuff. Right? Like this this is this is the result of linear least squares, and nonlinear least squares is a lot harder. Yeah. Minimum norm. Yeah, that's right. It's a it's a convenient property because that's what pseudo inverse does. But I think you're right to ask. That may or may not be the right thing. And we're gonna we're gonna generalize this so that we can be very explicit about what we wanted to do when no solutions exist or when there's multiple solutions exist. In fact, when multiple solutions exist, we should pick up. I, it would, it's better to not let pseudo inverse. I mean, as clever as it is, I'd rather say what I want it to do in the in the null space, right? And we can say that very explicitly. And then in, also in the case of not being sufficient, like if I'm, you know, throwing a baseball at really high speeds and I can't get it exactly right, I'd rather stop. You know, I'd rather like not throw the ball, you know, maybe or something like that, right? Rather than whoosh, to go off way off to the side. Uh, and I, that's actually. That's kind of that is true of real robot motions. Like you typically, if you can't follow a trajectory, the one we use the most, it will slow down and follow the actual trajectory as well as possible, but it will not deviate from the trajectory because if you worked hard to make a collision-free plan or something, you don't want to just you know have your low-level controller do that. Yeah. Yep.
So this is so so the, all all great questions. So what is what do I mean by best effort? I actually mean that the reconstruction error of j times v will be as close as possible to v in a least squares sense. So I will actually take the the norm the, the L2 norm of that of the vector and the reconstructed vector, and that norm will be minimized. It can happen. It can happen that you would not want to execute that motion. So we, that's why we're going to do better. This is this is the intro. This is the first. You know, this is like first controller. You can definitely just multiply the matrices and see what the the difference is. For sure. Yep. Yep. Yes. That's true. Uh, I would always stack them for in the generalized position. I would I would make that a vector representation. So if you had three in the wrist or something like this, then maybe you'd get up to nine or ten, you know, depending if you've added a new. But I but the generalized coordinate vector is always a vector. So, so we want in the, in the, this is a great question, so, I mean there's actually, yeah, because these things are good for co computing different quantities, um, sometimes you actually compute multiple things. Uh, Drake is going to do that in the background for you. So if it ever does work to compute rotation matrices and you don't change the context, then it will cache those and you and future computations will be faster because it already computed that once. Yeah. Uh, for sure, prismatic joints can be simulated in Drake or in any software. Um, it's a standard thing. Yes, there's definitely robotic arms that uh, that will have that. I guess maybe the most common thing you'll see is like even if you took our EWA, we, some people will put it on like a linear stage or something like this to move around. Um, those would be prismatic, but absolutely you'll see arms that are like the overhead arms that will have prismatic joints moving around. There's also there's very clever uh, parallel mechanisms and, and the like. Okay. Uh, I have a notebook that shows you the, I'll just tell you what it shows you so I can keep going here, but um, you can plot. So, so let me just say one more thing. So the, the, your question also was, can I know when I'm going to get multiple solutions? That's a good question. So let's just say, what, how do we know whether this matrix is invertible just by looking at it? The conditions on, it, on this getting a good solution are that the row rank, it's full row rank, okay? So if the, you, you will find an exact solution if JG function of Q is full row rank. Okay, so in this case, if it's six, if its rank is six, then that means you can perfectly reconstruct this. Okay, and pseudo inverse will find it. So um, the rank is a very sort of Boolean quantity of the matrix, and even before you drop rank completely, like in real robots, don't get five, rank five. Okay, they're they're not going to get rank, but they're going to get something very close to rank five, and you're gonna send extremely large velocities to your robot. So, so the, the interesting thing is not when this becomes strictly non-invertible, but when it becomes almost non-invertible numerically, such that when I ask for a velocity in some direction that I can't go, I will send an enormous V. When this thing becomes almost low rank, that's the, that's the condition to watch out for, okay? so. If JG is full row rank, that's fine. But the, the real thing you want to watch is like the singular values of J. And if the smallest singular value gets close to zero, that means there's some direction. If you ask it to move in that direction, you're going to get, when you take an inverse of something close to zero, you're going to get something close to infinity. 
and you're going to get very large velocities. That's the problem. So if I, for instance, take my Iwa and I straighten its arms out, that's, when, that's the condition where my ability to move, so it was, if I ask it to move in a velocity like this, it's going to say I need extremely large velocities because that lever arm is so small in order to move at the commanded velocity, and you just don't want to send that to the robot. Okay. So in practice, in the notebooks, if you want to, to run them, uh, uh, you'll see that, that I'm, I plot out like the lowest singular value, and you can watch. The arm gets straight, the singular value gets close to zero, and you're in bad shape. Okay, so you know singularities are this thing that we think about a lot. Uh, sometimes we think about them in motion planning, so we try not try to avoid you know straightening the arm. It happens on de you know so if you have like a teleop interface and you're just messing around with your robot and you're like I don't know trying to do something clever, then you're you're going to go whunk, you know like this. And and if your controller isn't protecting you from that, you will yeah you know either bad things will happen or the robot will power down or fault or something like that. So you have to you kind of have to think about this when you're writing your low level controller. But people get funny about um, about thinking about you know singularities. Like, is, is it's it's not a black hole, right? It's not like the robot explodes. Uh, it's really it, so. I, okay, here's a here's a way to phrase that question: Is it the math that's breaking, or is it the robot that's is it is it like a is it physically something that's stuck right in the robot? And it's really the sort of the math. It's the map from end effector to join angle that's breaking. So that the thinking in end effector coordinates fails when you get into a singularity. That's the, not the right place to think about it. But the robot can perfectly go through singular configurations as long as you're not thinking in end effector space. And to make that point, let me jump to this. I made this like super simple example, okay? It's a two-dimensional robot. The kinematics are perfectly clean. It has a singular configuration, which as you can see in two lines. Um, when the, the arm goes straight. Okay, but I'm going to play basically a sine wave and go in and out of, of I can make it flex. There we go. Okay, I can go and make it in and out of singularity. It's no problem. We can write down exactly what the Jacobian does during that, and the singular value gets to zero and back out again, and that's fine. Nothing explodes, right? It's perfectly good. So what's happening there? It's kind of it's an interesting. It's you have to sort of think through that. So the map that says, "Tell me if I'm if I'm perfectly straight." Now I'll stop it because that's going to be annoying. I'm perfectly straight. The map says there is no velocity I can execute that will make my hand come closer to the to the base. But there's clearly a velocity. There's clearly something I can execute to get me closer to the base. What's up? What happened? Yeah. Second order. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. So instantaneously, the velocity at that moment, even though the, the command's going through, right, the velocity going towards the base is zero. But it can instantaneously accelerate towards the base. So at the next time step, it's a little bit more, and then it's going to go through. So you have to look at the second derivative to get out of that particular one. Or you just send sine waves in. If you think in joint space, then you're immune to that mapping, of course. You can, um, so once you're in the six-dimensional land, then derivatives make sense. You can just take simple derivatives. I don't have to explain the different representations and stuff like this. So you can really just take j dot. And there's a canonical choice for j dot once you have, the, once you have j. That's good, yeah. Okay, so this is the makings of a controller. Okay, now we have the basic idea that we're going to write this diff IK controller, where if you put on an input port the desired spatial velocity, a six by one number, and you tell me the, you know, in the in the thing that implements the system, you tell me what the robot's like. Okay, I will call calc Jacobian spatial velocity. I'll take an inverse and I'll compute this velocity out. Okay, so let's do that. It's worth worth doing. I'm
I'm just going to send a simple feed forward constant command and spatial velocity here. Okay. I just said a constant spatial velocity and I gave it a little bit of a twist just so it wasn't just going straight down or whatever. Okay. But if I just send move your hand down in this, you know, this uh, translational velocity and a little bit of angular velocity and it does its thing. Okay, and it's just a few lines of code. In, in Drake, when you write the, in the leaf system, you, you make a new system, you basically have to declare the input ports, the output ports, and then you make your little output, which just calcs the Jacobian to get the spatial velocity. I just hard-coded the desired. I take a pinv and I set the output. Okay, and I've done the done the work. Yeah. Okay, we're going to make that a little bit better and a little bit more general in a second here. One more detail that I that I left behind here. So, what is um, how did we go from this to this? Right, I had a piecewise pose trajectory that we computed by composition of transforms and then slurping them together, right? But how did I go from this to an instant, uh, sort of the derivative of that? Yes? You can do it, it, you don't have to fit anything, you can do it perfectly. And it's just the same math of all the, <clears throat> the spatial derivatives and spatial quantities. We do know the entire function. So actually, in so far in the code, when we put this together, we actually represented this as a, a piecewise pose trajectory, we called that, okay, which was doing linear interpolation For translation, and slurp, quaternion slurp, for the rotations. And this is, this is one of the trajectory classes in, in Drake, right? It turns out you can just, and we, you know, we called, I called this, XG trajectory in the code, for instance. Since these are such common operations, the trajectory classes all support the types of operations you want to run on them. So you can just say equals XG traj dot make derivative. Okay, and it does exactly the spatial operations needed to map from the quaternion slurp into a perfect piecewise. This one is a piecewise polynomial now. Which is linear interpolation in spatial velocity. And it just comes out of the same types of, of transformations, not a bad choice, of uh, conversions that we used to go back and forth between the different representations. Okay, so let me just show you real quick since I got it open here. This is my first crack at the gimbal lock, right? I've got a gimbal, I've got a mustard bottle. It rotate. It does all the right things, but I'm like, no one's going to know what I'm talking about. So I, I, I can that. I'll make it better tomorrow. Okay. So now let's just think about putting that whole thing together, okay? So we have the sketch with keyframes. We're going to make the gripper frames. This is the code I showed you before. 
just a composition of all the different pick, pre-pick, place, pre-place. I set the timings. I set the initial gripper position, the initial object position, and a goal object position. Okay, visualize them for fun. Then we're gonna turn those into trajectories the way we did before. Run those through. Thirty seconds to execute. You can visualize them. That was this visualization we said before. You can turn those into tra tra trajectories. Draw those trajectories. You can turn the orientations into trajectories as, with slurp. Make my little open close gripper command. I'm going to do make derivative to get the translational. Okay, and then basically the pseudo inverse controller. Let me even put this up slightly cleaner on here. So the pseudo inverse controller has a vector input port, which is the spatial velocity commanded coming in. VWG, it's six elements. It takes in the current EWA position. That's a seven element vector input, okay? It has one output port, which is the EWA commanded velocity, which is seven numbers, right? And it, to evaluate that output port, you call it calc output. So anytime somebody asks for my output, it calls calc output, and it, I get VG and Q from the input ports. I set the positions of my internal plant to Q so that I, I can do kinematics at that state. I get my calc spatial velocity, jg, okay? I had to do one little hack because otherwise it wanted to move the, you know, it gives me the Jacobian also of the fingers, and I didn't, I wanted that to be separate, so I just pulled off the fingers, elements of my Jacobian. I didn't pull off the fingers. I, I removed the rows of the jg corresponding to the fingers, and then I uh, computed the pseudo inverse and set from vector, okay? You put that, that's just this code you saw right here. Okay, I get excited. Yeah, I know that's a little anticlimactic, but uh, it'll, it takes a second and then it'll be beautiful. Actually, don't know why Meshcat doesn't update in that case. Here we go. Okay, so everything is computed directly. This is a simulation now, not just a, play, a plan playback. You can tell there's the contact forces between the gripper and the brick. Okay, it's a, our first end-to-end -end system. We got all the pieces together to do that. Ah, that's, the, that's the least uh, impressive thing I've ever been clapped for, but thank you. Okay, and it's fairly, you know, simple. You have the trajectory source, which is we computed, the that goes into the pseudo inverse controller, our integrator, which is just an object, and that goes right into the EWA position command. And then we have a simple little WSG command. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Questions about that? Yeah. There is no acceleration uh, compensation here. So what would go wrong? So if I were to um, choose a trajectory in my gripper frame, this is a really good uh, point. So if I were to, since I ignored the, the arm completely when I made my gripper frame, if I accidentally put a gripper, desired gripper that was sort of at arm's length, for instance, then this controller would not do good things. Yep. So we're gonna, I would not run that on the robot. 
right? I would not give you a teleop device and tell you to run it on the robot. I'm gonna, we're gonna make a better one now. So uh, I guess in the, the beginning of the next lecture. So just to forecast that. This pseudo inverse is magical because it's actually solving an optimization problem. You can think about this as the, it's actually solving that least squares optimization problem I, I spoke to a little bit. And we can do a, op, take an optimization perspective to generalize this. Okay, so if we want to solve a slightly bigger optimization problem, so we say be as close as possible, but if you have extra degrees of freedom, then here's what I want you to do. Or if you get close to singular, don't do this. You know, we can start putting guardrails in, and I'll tell you an optimization view of making a better version of that controller. And that one you could hammer on, and, and it'll be pretty robust. Other questions? Yes. Yep, so um, mathematically, the, the code defines continuous derivatives. And um, you, know, you just define a dynamical system that has continuous derivatives that are one, you know, that are the, the magnitude of the input. Um, and then behind, underneath Drake, whenever there's a continuous time system, then it's always running some integrator. And there's a suite of integrators you pick from. By default, I put this in, in whenever you're using the hardware station, there's just doing a fixed step integration with certain, so like a, a forward Euler. Actually, it's not. It's a, a, I think it's fourth order, but fixed time step. But you can easily switch between, you can do Runga Kata, you can do um, a stiff solver, whatever. There, there's a suite of integrators you can pick from. Yeah. It's actually, so when we make a more advanced optimization-based version, then you have to be a little bit careful about that because if your optimization-based thing becomes um, is, is expensive to compute and, it's, and your solver starts trying to integrate at high accuracy, then it could solve a lot of optimization problems to move a red brick. Uh, and you do want you want to avoid that? Yes. Uh, so let me just say that more, a little bit more carefully. So the six degree of freedom arm um, has an analytic IK solution when you have six revolute joints, uh, but it's not actually perfect. It, it, it's um, it's not always unique. There's still multiple solutions. I think there's eight. Tommy would know exactly the, what how many solutions there are in the six. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, so you still have to make some choices about like, do you want your elbow here? Do you want your elbow here? And stuff like this. And that would be a direct IK solution, which implies something, of course, if you were gonna do diff IK, it would also be well behaved. But that would typically circumvent the need for diff IK. And you go straight for IK in that sort of setting. If you were to, you could, if you had a trajectory in end effector Q, you could come up with a trajectory out of it. You, I guess, you'd have to interpolate carefully around that. Otherwise, you could get into the same things. But it's really the mapping from of velocities that gets to be problematic. Yeah. Yes. Six degree of freedom robots are terrible. No, sorry. They're, they're, I mean, they're mathematically beautiful. Okay, but like. Um, yeah, if you have a six degree freedom robot that like picks something up, you're going to be so frustrated that you can't like get around or do, you know, it, it feels extremely limiting uh, once you have kinematic constraints, right? So I was being a little dramatic, but I, but I really think seven degree of freedom is common because you need it. In fact, I think probably the robots of 2025 or something are going to have even maybe another wrist joint or something. I think most of the robots today are meant for picking things up from above and it gets really frustrating to put a KUKA in the sink. You know, it's just like really frustrating. And then if you pick up a spatula and try to, it's like terrible because you've got like a, not only six degrees of freedom or seven degrees of freedom and you have a long wrist, then the kinematics are very hard to find solutions. Okay, good. We'll do the optimization view next time. <laughs>